Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Gary. I'm Sheko's editor in chief of Accelerate Special Issues and on online news sites. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the industrial end users and contractors session. Happy you can join us online today. We have an excellent session in store. Uh, a couple of reminders that as an attendee, you can ask questions at the right of your screen. Um, please ask them in the question, not the chat box. And uh, there's also a poll that you can take. Let me just uh, share my screen and show you what the question is. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, where is it? I'm not finding my... Uh, okay, I'm having a bit of problem finding the... Hang on, look, oh, wait a minute. No, all right, uh, cancel that. There is a, I was trying to find the question. The question has to do with what is the um, natural refrigerant system that you think will be used in five years in the industrial uh, industry. You can uh, find that question in the poll, in the poll box uh, on your screen. And I encourage everybody to answer that so we can see what the results are towards the end. Okay. Uh, this. I'm just showing it now for you, Michael, so everyone gets a chance to see it. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I'll just show it for a second, but it's on the, so everyone knows yeah. it's on the right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's what I said. Yeah. These are the different okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Franco. Um, and as Mark said, uh, this presentation and all the others in the conference will be available uh, online. So, um, as I said, we have a really nice, interesting panel assembled for today's uh, session here. Um, we have three presentations and they each discuss a different type of industrial natural refrigerant technology, uh, CO2, transcritical CO2, low charge ammonia and ammonia CO2. So our first uh, presenter will be actually two presenters um, Christopher Wolf, Bimbo Bakeries USA, and Francisco Picasso of Grupo Bimbo. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about them. Christopher Wolf is the Corporate Director of Environmental and Sustainability for Bimbo Bakeries USA. He's worked in the food industry since 1996. Um, he currently, as I said, is the Corporate Director of Environmental Sustainability, responsible for leading environmental sustainability efforts at their operations throughout the United States and Canada. He's also active with sustainability efforts at the parent company, Grupo Bimbo, and uh, he'll be speaking. And then a second speaker is Francisco Pigazzo, uh, project manager of Grupo Bimbo, the parent company. Uh, he's been there since 2015. And since 2018, he has been leading the global refrigerant strategy for Grupo Bimbo, while he continues to follow up CapEx projects in different regions where Grupo Bimbo is present. So with that introduction, I will turn it over to the folks from Grupo Bimbo. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, then I will share my screen. Please let me know when you can see it. Yes, yes, it's there. All right. Okay. So, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will give you a little bit of context of uh, what we're doing at the global scale regarding uh, refrigerants. And then uh, Chris can present the project that we're implementing today in Chicago, which is a, a success story for, for us. Right? Um, so, uh, I will, I will uh, say that Grupo Bimbo today is the largest bakery uh, in the world. So, we started in 1945 in Mexico City one bakery. And uh, well, today I'm proud to say that uh, we have operations in, in over 33 countries around the world, and we have around 200 uh, bakeries or productive centers. Um, and even though we are the largest bakery uh, in, in the world, our vision is to become one of the most important food companies as well. 
And um, today we do not only bake bread, but uh, we also have uh, sweet baked goods, uh, cookies, pastries, but also salted snacks, and even in some places ready to eat food. So we are slowly uh, getting there. Um, and as you might imagine, um, we use refrigerants in our whole supply chain, uh, up from, from ingredient storage up to uh, distribution. And in some places, in some, in some uh, divisions, we use uh, refrigerants uh, more than others. Uh, for example, we have a, a very big division that handles the, the quick service restaurants. And this is a frozen business. Uh, so we supply uh, the hamburger buns to customers such as McDonald's, uh, Burger King, or KFC. And while you might imagine as this business being a frozen business, refrigerants, well, they have a major role on, on, on that process. So our purpose is to, to become a sustainable, highly productive, and deeply humane company. And we have always considered that uh, we as Grupo Vimo, we can do the difference. Uh, so uh, we became a member of the Consumer Goods Forum in the, in the past years. And from them, we began to uh, create a refrigerant strategy that focuses mainly on our manufacturing process and because that's where we have uh, more refrigerants. And the objective of this strategy is to gradually uh, phase out HCFCs and HFCs refrigerants. And we, we are aiming to install natural refrigerants as our number, number one option. So for this, uh, we have developed internal policies uh, and procedures uh, and the business units, the, the, the companies in which uh, Grupo Bimbo is conformed, they have to, to, to follow these, these um, policies whenever they buy new, new equipment, new assets. And it could be either for a new line or just asset renewal whenever the asset is obsolete. And um, they also have to, to comply with the local codes and regulations regarding the use of rich refrigerants. Uh, such as, for example, the GWP limits. Um, and well, we are we are um, we're implementing this strategy in, in the 200 bakeries we have, but we have found several challenges that make this implementation a little bit um, more difficult than expected. And um, well, one of them is is cost. So uh, we have seen that <clears throat> the natural refrigerant systems for our applications they are around three to four times more expensive than the ones uh, that they, the, the conventional systems. So this is a major issue for, for us, especially in some places or some regions in which um, uh, we are not leaders in the market or, or we have some struggles with sales. Um, the other issue that we have seen is uh, regarding technical support. So um, in America, for our applications, these technologies are not that common yet. Uh, so uh, even if we get the, the equipment from, from the OEM, uh, we would struggle not having the right technical support right away. Uh, because you might imagine that um, having an equipment down even for a few minutes in, in our business, well, it's a real issue for us. So we need to have the, the, the right um, support and it has to be local and it has to be immediate. So that's something that we have been struggling with <coughs> while implementing the, the, the strategy. And uh, finally, um, change, man change management. So we need to overcome some uh, misconceptions and paradigms, even from our own uh, maintenance managers and engineering groups. So that this is something internally that we need to, to tackle uh, because we have heard things like um, these systems being very and totally unsafe or these systems being inefficient. And even some, some people say that uh, these systems are even more harmful to the environment than, than the old R22s or, or R410s. So all these mis misconceptions, we need to, to tackle them. Uh, however, I know that with time, we will slowly overcome these challenges through proper communication, training, and also through our OEMs and contractors. And this is a request for, for them to find ways to reduce costs so these systems can become more attractive. Uh, well, now I will leave you with Chris, who will get you through the um, success story in Chicago. Please, Chris, go ahead. Thanks, Francisco. Uh, real quick uh, overview for Bimbo Bakeries USA. 
Uh, you know us through our brands, Thomas English Muffins, Entenmann's, Sara Lee, to name a few. Um, we currently have 62 bakeries. Um, the majority are in the U.S. Uh, we do have two plants uh, under our umbrella in Canada. Um, we're very leveraged with uh, EPA Energy Stars program. We've been named the partner of the year three consecutive years. We currently have 13 facilities certified. Um, our parent company, Group Obimbo, pledged uh, with RE100. Um, and we're proud to say that the U.S. operation is now 100% renewable for electricity through a partnership uh, with a virtuous purchase power agreement in a wind farm. So we're very proud of our sustainability record. Um, we've been working in refrigeration. I, I think it's one of the first things that I got involved in way back when I joined the industry in the 1990s, um, where we were phasing out the, the first generation refrigerants and uh, we're leveraging R22. And ultimately, uh, we switched from R22 to, to 134A, 410A, and those, those types. Um, but uh, it's been a journey. Um, when I started, it was all direct expansion. Um, anybody that's been in a large commercial bakery realized that we have these huge uh, mixers that mix up the dough. There's quite a bit of vibrations, and those mixer bowls crack from time to time. So unfortunately, they leaked refrigerants. Um, the industry as a whole did not have a good track record with EPA, um, and most of us bakeries signed a, an agreement with EPA around 1999-2000 to get our bakeries back on track. Um, that's when we pushed away from direct expansion, went to centralized glycol systems, and at that time, R22 was still the refrigerant of choice. Um, the good news is um, we're to the point where 13% of our volume is R22. The rest has been con converted over to HFCs. So that'd be 134A, 410s, which is great from a global warming or from a ozone uh, standpoint. But as you guys know, from a global warming potential, it's not so good. Um, so we're going to transition away from those. Um, and for this case study, we looked at conventional um, chemical-based. Um, so our new standard is going to be um, an HFO um, for what we need, probably 513A. Um, and then we compared it to low-charge ammonia systems or a hybrid low-charge uh, CO2 system. For this specific um, bakery, if you want to go to the next slide, Francisco, we ended up uh, making the capital investment and we went to low-charge. Um, this bakery, just to give you where it was, um, we, we acquired it about five years ago. It was one of the last commercial bakeries that I'm aware of that still use direct expansion. The good news was that it, it was a, uh, they had converted over to 422B. Um, so it was no longer R22, but the bad news is it continued to leak, which um, that's not a good thing for what we value. Um, so we recognized it quickly. Um, we put a capital plan together with uh, Francisco and our partners at GB. And like I said, we looked at the varying technologies, but for this one, we chose to go with low charge ammonia. You go to the next slide. Um, we partnered with air management. Um, they designed the system and we ended up going with um, zero zone as far as the ammonia com component. Um, and again, I misspoke. This, this specific one is um, a, a hybrid system. Um, does have less than 500 pounds, which was advantageous for us. Um, gets us under most of the, the requirements from a regulatory. It also sits outside, so it limits the risk to our associates. Um, it has all the state-of-the-art um, efficiencies. Um, we have VFD pumping and so forth. Um, if we go to the benefits, you got the efficiency, the reliability, and the quality. We, we consider it future-proof because it is a natural refrigerant. So from a global warming potential, um, it's zero. And also we don't have to worry about the ozone. Um, there is considerable amount of uh, energy uh, reduction by going to this type of system versus conventional. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it basically on average, it's 460 less carbon tons per year versus conventional get about a $30,000 USD, um, US dollar savings per year based on current pricing. 
Um, and for us, and I want to clarify this. So the most of our fleet is what we call fresh bakery. So fresh bakery is where the product is baked and shipped typically the same day. And it has a short shelf life of a, between 14 and 21 days. So for those type of bakeries, for a fresh bakery, it is the first time that our company has gone with a natural refrigerant um, and went away from conventional. We do have plants under our fleet that are frozen plants that have very large scale ammonia systems. But um, for a fresh bakery, it's the first time that we went natural refrigerant and it's actually being commissioned uh, next week. Next slide. So that's, uh, I think we're within our 10 minutes. I don't know, Mike, are we doing questions now or later? Uh, just a quick, uh, quick question for me. Um, so this is your first, uh, first low charge or ammonia CO2 glycol installation? Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, I believe there's a, uh, there, there, there's a division of Grupo Bimbo in Canada, Wholesome Harvest Baking. Do you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, that's, yep, yeah, that's part of us. Yeah, they have a, they have a Newton system there. Um, yep. That yep. I've written, that I actually wrote about a few years ago, uh, which is an yep. ammon also an ammonia CO2 uh, system. It, did you consider using that one? Um, we looked at it. Uh, and again, that, that, that's considered like under our structure, uh, the Canadian wholesome harvest is separate from us. Right. Well, and that specific plant was spun off. Now it's under what we call Bimbo Canada. We did look at their system. Um, in the end, uh, we kind of started a new work with air management, our preferred vendor and came up with the strategy that we have in Chicago. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Yeah, no uh, really appreciate it. Next uh, pre uh, presenters, presenter is uh, Jonathan Burney. A little bit about Jonathan. He's the business development manager for Simco, which is a major contractor builder in Canada. And um, Jonathan uh, has been involved with projects, natural refrigerant projects, including conventional flooded and pump recirculation systems, new technologies such as low charge DX, CO2 cascade, and transcritical systems. Recently, uh, he spent five years um, as, as, manager, uh, as, a, as a manager with experience on the service sector. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and welcome everyone on my uh, presentation for CO2 transcritical application for seafood processing. A little bit of background on Simcoe for those of you that do not know us. Uh, Simcoe has a hundred year history in uh, design build refrigeration uh, installations. Uh, we've been primarily a natural refrigerant contractor uh, using lots of ammonia, but we are seeing the increased uh, interest and demand for CO2. And to date we have over 50 installations of CO2 refrigeration systems. Um, CO2 is uh, a great option. Uh, the transcritical uh, application in particular is, is quite common. Uh, one of the limitations we currently see with that is the size of equipment that's available on the market. Uh, but we are uh, seeing that suppliers and manufacturers are working on making uh, compressors and valves and whatnot in larger sizes. So we look forward to, to having access to that uh, equipment in the near future. Uh, ammonia obviously is still a great solution, uh, especially for large installations uh, in both the recreational and industrial markets. Uh, CO2 cascade, uh, CO2 ammonia is also a very good uh, long-term solution for these uh, large industrial applications, especially where you have low temperature uh, requirements such as blast freezing and uh, spiral freezing. A little bit about the customer uh, related to this project. The customer had an existing facility which was Freon based and they had a, a relationship with a local service provider that was uncomfortable with CO2 and its application. For that reason, they came to Simcoe to develop that project further. The project in question had low temperature process and freezer loads, as well as some medium temperature 
uh, room loads such as docks and receiving areas. The project in question had a very short timeline uh, from sale to commissioning, and which was related to the fishery season. Uh, we had to have them up online and running in order to accept product coming in from the shipping, uh, the fishing boats. We also had a requirement from the customer to plan for future expansion. And the customer stated that they wanted a environmentally friendly and efficient solution. They specifically stated they didn't want Freon and that they would also consider an ammonia to CO2 cascade solution along with a CO2 transcritical option. Here we have the layout of the building. In the top left corner here was the uh, mechanical compressor room that we had to work with. This central section would be the process area where most of the low temp loads uh, existed. That was approximately 12,000 square feet. Down at the bottom, we had the shipping and receiving area, which was around 4,000 square feet. And this is where most of the medium temperature loads uh, existed. The project was uh, understood from the very beginning to consist of two phases. So the first phase we completed this year and are currently looking at the second phase of this project for 2021. The first phase consisted of holding freezers, shipping docks, receiving area, and a cluster and brine chill tank. So these two tanks were uh, process uh, cooling loads uh, for the brine systems. And the approach that was taken here was uh, to supply two CO2, CO2 transcritical racks. The first rack, rack A, was serving primarily the holding, shipping, and receiving areas and their evaporators. And the second rack, rack B, was serving the brine chilling loads. And our design had to allow for phase two in the near future. Here we have a simple P and ID of phase one. As I mentioned, this consisted of two transcritical racks. Here we have rack B, which was connected to the brine chilling loads. And here you have rack A, which was connected to all the evaporator loads. Here we have the holding freezer. Here we have the uh, shipping dock, and I believe here we have the receiving area. Each of these racks had a dedicated cascade cooler, and both racks were served by a backup emergency generator and a backup condensing unit, uh, such that if there was a power failure at the plant, these two devices would kick on and they'd maintain uh, pressure on these two racks so that we didn't have any release of CO2 due to overpressurization. Here we have on the left a uh, isometric of the uh, compressor room where the racks were located. Here's rack A, here's rack B. As you can see, we have space here for a third rack, uh, rack C for uh, phase two. And we had good access into the room using this roll-up door. The uh, both units, as I mentioned earlier, had a dedicated adiabatic gas cooler located directly above the refrigeration compressor room. Here they are here. And here we have an isometric of the installation itself. Here in the top corner, we have the refrigeration compressor room where the racks were located. On this roof is where you would see the gas coolers. And here you can see the piping that was run through the plant uh, connected to the individual evaporators. The low temp uh, brine chill loads are not shown here, but the piping came off rack B and, and made its way to those loads. Uh, point of interest here, with the CO2 option, the, the piping is, is relatively small and each evaporator is piped back to the uh, rack which is served, which it serves. Um, so this made the individual runs very small and uh, we were able to locate those runs inside the building, which worked well because they were able to, to construct the building and then we just uh, put the piping in place once they were ready. Also by having uh, racks, uh, you know, we were able to manufacture those and test those off site. And that just worked really well with the tight schedule uh, that we had to deliver on. Here we have uh, some energy consumption uh, forecasts uh, for three different options. Uh, we have a CO2, we have a ammonia, and we have a cascade, and that's a CO2 ammonia cascade solution. The CO2 transcritical package is uh, two stage. The ammonia system is single stage with economizer and the cascade system is single stage on each refrigerant. 
Here on the top right, uh, we have the blue is the projected uh, kilowatt hour consumption for the, each system. The blue is the CO2 transcritical, the orange is the ammonia, and the green is the cascade. Interesting thing to note here, given that this is a fishery business and in Canada, that's a, a regulated industry. So their, pro their process or production timeframe falls under two months, April and May in this case. So you can see that you know, when they're running process, their loads are much, much higher. The rest of the year, they're really just holding products. So it's holding freezers, shipping, receiving loads. So that's why there's a very large discrepancy in the loads. Also of interest here, we have the black line, which is the mean uh, ambient temperature for this location in uh, Eastern Canada. And you can see that the max uh, mean temperature is only 15 degrees. So it is a cool climate. And based on this, we're actually seeing that the CO2 transcritical option is, is actually a, a very efficient solution in this case. And uh, you can see during this, the warmer months, July and August, uh, the energy usage of the cascade system does catch up with the others. But in the shoulder seasons, it, it's actually the lowest uh, energy uh, solution. Also of interest here is the cascade system. Um, surprisingly, the performance is, is not as good as one might expect. And I think in this case, that's due to the fact that there isn't a lot of low temperature load in this particular situation. So some of the barriers and solutions or challenges that we had was uh, we had this very tight delivery schedule, which the drop dead date was based on receiving product in the building. So not being done was not an option. Uh, we tackled this by going with packaged equipment that was, as I mentioned earlier, fabricated and tested and delivered to site, essentially ready to go. It just had to be placed and piped. And also is it, it was advantageous to use uh, CO2 transcritical because the piping is, is relatively small and can be installed in a timely manner. Uh, right from the very beginning, it was clear that the customer uh, valued technology and innovation and our system delivered on that by using some of the newest technology available to us. And we were also to offer them some heat reclaim off of the CO2 packages for their underfloor heating systems. And as I mentioned earlier, we also had to plan for a future expansion, which given the size of the packaged equipment, we had ample space to add a third rack in the future. So some of the lessons we learned in this project, uh, you know, customers value innovation. Uh, the best solutions must consider all the factors while delivering on lowest cost and uh, lowest operate, uh, operating costs. So, you know, upfront costs and the cost to run the system through its life. Again, supplying the, the package is ready to go was instrumental to meeting this timeline. So pre-packaged equipment was very valuable here. And lastly, uh, environmentally friendly refrigerants. They offer a, a long service life with very little risk to the customer. Uh, they don't have to worry about uh, changes to regulations or codes, which may limit the service life of the equipment or the cost of the refrigerant. So they saw value in this and, and many of our customers do. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that you can submit questions in the question tab. Uh, we also having a, a poll uh, that you can answer as well in the poll tab. Um, quick question from me. Did you say that the customer originally did not want to use CO2? I uh, know actually they're, they're contractors. So they had a relationship with their existing facility, which was Freon, uh, and their contractor was not able to uh, work with them on a CO2 solution, which is why we were fortunate enough to get involved in that project. But the customer knew from the beginning that they wanted CO2, or it was, a, it was one of the options they wanted to see. Oh, so it was the contractor that wasn't able, their original contractor. Okay. That's right. But they wanted, they wanted a natural, for, they wanted to. They certainly did, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and this is their first time with CO2. Yes. Right, right. Okay. Interesting. And so uh, the adiabatic is what's used to uh, help with the efficiency. There aren't any other uh, efficiency related uh, technologies installed. No, it was the, yeah, you're right. The adiabatic units. I mean, given the climate there, yeah, it, it, was, it was a very good fit. Right, right. Okay, great. All right.
we may have some more questions for you later, but thank you very much for that. Thank you. All right, so uh, moving on now to our last presentation <clears throat> is uh, gonna be given by Bob Glaser, construction representative, project manager and enterprise maintenance manager for Shamrock Foods. And Bob has a background <clears throat> and experience in facilities management, construction and cold storage, warehouse and distribution design, project management and building maintenance. Um, in the past 15 years, managing over 18 sites across the US, he's seen most every type of damage and breakdown possible. He uses this background and knowledge to maintain design and build new sites and update old sites that are better and easier to maintain. So Bob, take it away. All right, thank you. And then share my screen here. And can you see that? Yes, yes I can. Okay. Oops, my show. So one of the things that uh, Shamrock Foods did is um, we've got a lot of, there was a lot of small distribution over the Western United States and, and uh, a new kind of a, a larger distribution facility was needed in, in Colorado and kind of the middle of the country. And so when we started this, this design process, um, we knew about how big we wanted, we knew it wanted automated, and we've always liked ammonia. Just, just the, the, uh, the use of that refrigerant, and, and I agree with some of the other presenters, we don't have to worry about, is it gonna change? You know, is this equipment not um, long-term feasible? Because we've, we've had, just like everybody else, we've had some R22 and then you're converting that and you can't buy uh, refrigerant for it or you go to 134A. And, and so we've kind of made some of those, some of those in some of our smaller uh, facilities. And so we, we looked at the ammonia and then um, we do have, uh, they have, two different sites. So this is kind of where we, we came up with how, how do we, how do we put a package together for this large brand new site that is cutting edge, you know, we're into, you know, digitalization. We, we want this to be efficient. We need it to be efficient. And so we looked at two different sites that we have. We have the one on the right is in New Mexico, and that is an ammonia plant centralized, um, uh, on the back of the building, it's got um, 15 penthouses. And then we also have in Southern California, uh, a leased property. So the leased property, that's, that's hard to, if you're not doing ground up to do centralized ammonia. So on the leased property, what we did is you have package units, but they're all free on. So when you have those two buildings and it's the same basic products inside, that was easy for us to come up with what's this cost? What's, what's ammonia cost? What's refrigeration cost? Not, not, not talking about greenhouse gas, just actual physical cost to run these two. And what we found is the ammonia is so much more efficient, but by the time we add water to it, by the time we add PSM programs to it, by the time we add maintenance to it, um, by the time we, you know, loss of head pressure running all over the, all over the top of the, the building, um, and then you compare that to the refrigerants that we're using in uh, Southern California. And it's like, yeah, the, the power consumption is huge on California, but we don't have any water. We don't have any water treatment. Um, a big thing for the maintenance, especially from, you know, my standpoint as, as a maintenance manager, when you have one of three uh, large compressors, say 350 horsepower compressor in New Mexico, and we have vibration or we have one that goes down on a Friday night, you have to get there. You have to maintain that. You've got to repair that. That is a huge thing. When we looked at uh, Southern California, we're using uh, Vicom for our controls there and everything. 
if I have a unit go down in Southern California, I get online, we've got redundancy, there's smaller packages, I shut it off. It's Friday night, I shut it off, we are going to deal with that on Monday. You know, we can ramp up a couple of the other ones, we can keep some doors closed, it's not an emergency. So we put all of that uh, kind of together to, to come up with what we have here is uh, the low charge ammonia penthouse units. So each one of these at 450 pounds uh, of ammonia or about um, are spaced throughout. So we're kind of, kind of getting the best of both worlds. You know, we've got some redundancy here. Um, we can shut stuff off. I don't have to have a panic moment in the middle uh, of, of a weekend or a holiday or any of those things. We're able to, to do like we did with the free on package units. So now we've got the best of the uh, ammonia and, and with the low charge, but yet we've got the best of the package units in there. Um, one of the things that we did find is there, there is some downside to this. So, you know, it, it seems really good and, and it is in, in most aspects, but each one of those penthouse units is 34,000 pounds. And when you have a building that's, you know, the, the roof of this building is 22 acres. You don't just set 34,000 pounds out in the middle of that thing from the edge um, after the fact. So we had to set these units as we were going. So we had some, some structural challenges um, to put those units on and get those set as we were building it out. And then, you know, for the maintenance, for the compressors, all of those things, we've got some big six wheeled carts that we've designed that, and we take our elevators all the way to the roof. So, so we're able to maintain them, but the installation was definitely a, a challenge uh, for this type of unit on a very, very large, building and, and we've kind of gone to that that square you know you look at these units here on on both the docks those are easy you know you can set those at any time it's the ones out in the middle of a large building like that so we've got 31 of abco units um there's seven different temp zones so we've got you know a big big freezer and, and then we've got some other temp zones um, we're also able to reuse some of that heat so we're reusing, we have no water, it is all air cooled, although we have the ability to, in, you know, if, if we see that we need a little bit more refrigeration, we can use adiabatic, we've got water up to all of those units, um, that, it's for a safety thing too. Um, and so we're able to, to even increase it more if we see that, that we need that. Um, the nice thing about this is just, you think about 2,300 uh, tons of refrigeration and we don't have any package that's got more than about 475 pounds of ammonia in it. So if we have some, some terrible problem, we've lost 475 pounds, you know, and it's, it's 80 feet in the air. We're able to uh, send that into the atmosphere and um, it, it's just a huge load off of, uh, of the maintenance and the, the safety guys and everything else, you know, all of some of our other facilities, we've got quite a bit, you know, some of the dairies are over 34,000 pounds and, and you have the flags and the testing and, and all sorts of uh, alarming and stuff like that. And, and we'll have, we'll have the flags and the, uh, the alarming and stuff here, but basically all the ammonia is on the roof. It's not near anybody. We can't run into the pipes with the forklifts. We can't, hit the units, um, those are always just a safety concern and a maintenance concern overall. Um, so then one of the things that Evapco did provide for us was a, a complete Revit design because we modeled this entire building. You know, the, the more complicated buildings get, the bigger buildings get, um, the design part of it going into it is so huge. And, um, they did give us a Revit design for each one of these units, although it was like, wow, it was it was huge. Each one of the files for this, which is if you're putting one unit into a Revit file or two units into a Revit file, that's good. Their design, their their drawings were so detailed. It had every bolt head, everything in it. It was just the files were huge. And when we loaded 31 of those files in there, 
nobody's computer that wasn't uh, liquid cooled could even run this thing. So we've, we've toned those down a little bit to get this to fit within um, our parameters and our design. But it was nice to have this totally modeled and have each one of those units totally modeled so that uh, every week we would get on with all of the engineers and we would use a program called Enscape, which takes that Revit and moves it into, into a, um, a format that anybody can look at. And, and we would fly through and we would take a look at where the units are and how those come down and um, how this all plays into everybody's everybody's stuff because you think about you know 10 miles of conveyors in there you've got structural you've got electrical in there you've got fire in there uh all the sprinkler lines you know how does all this stuff line up and, and evapco did such a nice job of of supplying us all the details all the information so that it really went through and and was nice to install one of the other things that we're doing here is with the low charge ammonia is the chiller package so that's, that provides us the uh, chilled glycol for, we do some ripening, so we call them banana rooms here, but it's ripening avocados, tomatoes, uh, bananas, all sorts of things. So, so we need some heat for that. We need heat for the glycol. So all the underfloor heating is glycol. And so by being able to reuse that heat um, is gonna save us you know, huge amounts of dollars long-term. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where we get to the benefits of this low charge, the benefits of the ammonia system, and uh, back to that digitalization. Now, will we know how to tune this, um, tune this building and these units in on day one? No, no, it's, this is a long-term process of not only predictive maintenance, but efficiencies on each one of those units. Um, the other thing we really liked about these is the open protocol. Um, we're going to be using uh, Trinium's Niagara to, to run these, to maintain these. Um, the other thing that you have on this, take, take, for example, that freezer. That freezer is, you know, in excess of 10 million cubic feet, and you want to keep that at 10 below zero that costs money, you know, that, that's power, that's, that's usage. And right now we're figuring on this building being right around 10 megawatts of power. Well, what we've decided to do and look at and the benefits of some of these low charge units and having multiple ones is we only have half of that in power generation. So we have five megs of power generation. So when the power goes out, everything comes offline. Within about 35 seconds, we bring the five megs back up. Those are run on natural gas. <clears throat> and then we start cycling through our low charge units. So we're maintaining temperature, but we're not bringing everything back up. So we're slowly ramping up and say, if it's a long term, uh, you know, the power's out for 10 hours or 12 hours or two days, we would just cycle through each one of those units to maintain temperatures um, in those areas, keep the doors closed. So we're able to, to really decrease that energy use and not have to generate so much uh, power during that process. One of the other things is um, with these and, and all, of the, all of the points you know, that are inside there, we can do some of our preventative maintenance. So all of our preventative maintenance, you know, do we get vibration analysis? We've got CTs on the power going in, how much we're using. So, you know, back to that digitalization, it's so important for maintaining these. It's so important for power consumption on these. Um, yeah, the nice thing about this type of a system, there's no water. We don't have to worry about you know, water treatment and legionnaires that, you know, that's been a big push here recently. Again, uh, you just don't want those kind of issues coming out of, out of your facility. Um, and, and then the other big thing was a little bit of redundancy, you know, even, even where we have 20 below zero on ice cream freezer, we do two compressors in that same penthouse so that we can maintain one and keep temperatures. We can also go through defrost and keep temperatures 
and uh, so so the benefits of the of the low charge ammonia really fit within all of our parameters what we wanted to do and, and it helps help shamrock in general save money and, and we hope over the next two years you know you get the the daily report cards and the monthly and the the annual and we'll kind of see what that looks like but but i see great things as far as uh, our, our power usage and that is uh, pretty much it for uh for that uh, system and that building okay thank you bob that was really interesting really ambitious um Thank you for, your, for that presentation. Uh, so we have some time for some questions. Um, I would like to invite the audience to submit them. Uh, w when did you say this project will be done, Bob? It's got, we're, we've got the, some of the units have got uh, the ammonia in them and uh, we're, we're kind of doing, we're trying not to freeze out the racking guys right at the moment. Uh, but, but we are turning some of them on, we're slowly cycling through. so. Uh, we're shooting for fully loaded and operational mid next year. Okay. And it's in Colorado? Yes. Whereabouts? Denver, just out, just actually off of uh, outside of the airport, DIA. And how many uh, facilities does Shamrock have altogether? There is 12 distribution facilities, but you know, the size, the size is all depending on where you're at, you know, Portland, it's, it's 20,000 square feet because it's Portland. There's, there's not that much distribution up there as opposed to Southern California or Denver or Phoenix, where the, the company originally started from, you know, they, they distribute huge amounts there. Right. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you, you mentioned that uh, one of them has a central ammonia plant uh, in, uh, was it New Mexico? Yes, so, and you know, Phoenix does too, and both the dairies do too. Centralized ammonia, is that more typical of what you uh, have in your system? We like the ammonia, we like the natural refrigerants. Um, so that's when we build one that's where we've been going in the past over the last past 20 years um but you know when you when you lease something and it's already built and it's there it's harder uh, but that's what's kind of exciting about some of the co2 and some of that uh some of the stuff we're seeing come out right now um, that may be viable for us on leased buildings or buildings that are already currently there but this this is your first low charge uh installation it is a low charge ammonia, a package. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so did you say that you had 31 units and one of them is a chiller? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. With chiller with glycol. Okay. And uh, so you, what do you think the uh, advantages are of these package? ammonia low charge uh, units compared to a centralized uh, ammonia. I mean, you mentioned that you distribute the ammonia among all these, these different units. So it's, it's a little bit better from a safety aspect. Is that one of the keys? It is, and, and just the efficiencies of it. So you think about, you know, that roof is 22 acres. It's, it's 1,295 feet down one side. So I put an ammonia plant, a centralized plant on one side. I've got to get that up 85 feet. I've got to come across and then I've got to run across that building. So just the head pressure loss of, you know, half a mile of pipe on ammonia there and back, plus maintaining the stands, you know, and we've had this, we've had it in Phoenix. Uh, we had a micro burst. We had some wind come up. It got a hold of some of the roofing tore that up and once that roofing sailed up and got a hold of them pipes, boy, it we didn't lose any ammonia, but it bent them up so bad that, you know, it was, it was a major refit on the roof with the ammonia systems. And uh, so this takes it all away. You know, my compressor is, is six feet away from uh, the evaporator. I, there is no loss there. I mean, that is just so short, it's quick, it's easy. And um, just the maintainability, you know, 
something goes wrong, I just shut that one off. It, it, that is now totally closed off and we will deal with that when I can get people there. And, and in, in package includes the evaporator, right? So everything is in the package and, and then you just deliver the, co the, the cold air into the room. Yep, the cold air is brought down. And what we've done with that on these units, uh, so we've got some, some mezzanine area and some dock below on, on the uh, inbound side. And uh, we've gone with solid concrete floors in there just because of the vibration, the noise, all that stuff. So we push air down. Uh, we break some off at the mezzanine, but most of it comes down through onto the dock. And at the dock, along both sides of the walls have fans. And so those fans help us, so those are variable speed fans, those help us maintain pressures and temperatures below and above. So you've got, you've got multiple things going on. You've got uh, a 10 below freezer, you've got a 40 degree dock, you've got two levels, and we're maintaining all of that. So what's good about that is each, each variable speed low charge ammonia penthouse is tied to a certain amount of fans. So even if I do shut down one of those going to the dock, I can maintain those pressures by, by running those fans differently and running those through there um, and maintaining those pressures and those temperatures um, across, across the board. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So we have uh, some results from our poll which natural refrigerant system will be most widely used five years from now in cold storage and food processing facilities? We got 38 votes. Franco, could you give us the results? Yeah. So the biggest was transcritical CO2 at 37%. Uh, second was low charge ammonia package to systems at 29% then low charge ammonia central systems at 18% and ammonia CO2 at 16%. All right, thank you, very interesting. So uh, transcritical is the number one, is the winner of this poll um, for what, what will be most popular in five years. Does that, uh, is, is, is that surprise you, Jonathan, Can you, given your experience with CO2? Uh, no, it's not surprising. I mean, there's a lot of technology going into the transcritical systems to make them more efficient as you approach the equator, right? You were kind of alluding to that a bit about the efficiency. Yeah. Uh, and, and in our case, because we're so far north, we didn't have to put ejectors, we didn't have to do parallel compression. But uh, all of that stuff is, you know, the industry is very active in, in that and in finding ways to make these systems more efficient. So uh, I, it is moving in that direction. I think the efficiency gap is closing and uh, it's a great solution. Right. And I mean, it, it, transcritical is uh, most prevalent in supermarkets, but uh, the, the uh, manufacturers have developed you know, larger compressors, larger s systems that enable it to handle industrial type load. So it's... we, we still see that limiting factor, as I mentioned very early on in my presentation, but I know there's a lot of uh, work going on to uh, make bigger equipment, make bigger valves, compressors. So I think the industry has definitely identified that and manufacturers are working on that for sure. Right, okay. Um, all right, so it's interesting. Um, the ammonia CO2 uh, is le less popular, but uh, but you would say, the, gr the Grupo Bimbo folks would say that that is still a, a, a very viable option. Yeah, it's a viable option. Um, now, to be candid with you, um, I think we'd be leaning more towards CO2 now. If we're going to do it again, not to say that the, the system we're installing um, isn't the right fit and it's not going to work properly. We, we have, we're definitely um, very confident in it, but um, I think as we move forward, we're going to be doing more of the CO2. Interesting. Yes, and uh, from a global perspective, a lot of our bakeries are near the equator. Uh, so a lot of uh, bakeries in, in Latin America, 
And we see CO2 a viable option, not just because of uh, not having ammonia and a little risk there with uh, uh, this kind of, of, um, of substance, but also regarding heat recovery. So we're exploring the, the heat recovery and for us in our applications, we can use that heat in, in the baking process. In our fermentation rooms, we can use that heat and it would make a little bit more sense to us to, to go to uh, CO2. But again, uh, we are open to all kinds of, uh, of uh, solutions with naturals. Okay, very good. All right, with that, I'm gonna close the session. I wanna thank our presenters very much for participating today. You did a great job, very, really uh, showed us a, a variety of systems and possibilities for the industrial space. Uh, and I think the, the future looks good for these systems. And, um, you know, it was really, really uh, great to have you. Um, if there are any uh, follow-up questions from the audience, you can uh, perhaps uh, ask them on the chat function or, or contact the speakers directly. And we'll take a 10 minute break and meet again at 1.45 for the utilities panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.